If this isn't medium rare, I think I might cry. So I'm wondering what the deal is with Julia Child's Beef Wellington. How come no one talks about it? How come there's no videos online of anyone trying to make it? Oh! <laughs> Bon appétit. Now the recipe is not in volume one of her famous cookbook, the one that has all the well-known recipes in it. It's in volume two, which I find has far less discourse. The thing is that YouTube loves beef wellingtons and everyone's always trying to recreate a certain celebrity chef's famous recipe. Uh, I've fallen victim to it twice now. Like Julia Child's beef wellington has a certain ring to it and you think that it'd be all over the web. Most definitely not. Maybe because it's just not solely a French recipe. I mean, it says here, is it English, Irish, or French? No one really knows, I don't think. I mean, the name is English, obviously, but the origin of it, I'm not gonna get involved. I have a theory that it's because this book is just so daunting to look at. It's scary. The recipe is a beast. I mean, you have to read all this stuff, and I have several times over and you're like looking at something and then it says flip to page whatever and you have to look at something here. And then it says refer to this book for certain things. It's a lot to grasp. The recipe goes like this. You need a brioche dough, you need a brown sauce, you need a heart of the beef filet sliced, stuffed, wrapped, and tied. And then you need to assemble it all and bake it. This recipe is incredibly uh, expensive. I'm kind of on edge about it. So I want to get it right, I'm focused, I don't want to fuck up. Shall we begin? I did already, last night. Sprinkle active yeast into some warm water and liquefy salt and sugar. Add it in. Warm, tepid milk, stir in this bowl. Add in my flour. Create a little well in the center. Add in my eggs, the yeast mix, rubber spatula it together until it starts to form something that I recognize. On my floured work surface, I'm gonna let it hang out for a few minutes. This next little bit is a lot to explain. If I went into the nitty gritty, you'd get bored. So here's the Cole's notes. Essentially, I just use this sweet combo of a lift, flip, and a slap, and then again and again, repeating until the dough had that body I was looking for. And I just kept that combo going until it stopped sticking to the surface. Then I cut up my butter into pieces and a little bit at a time, I worked it into the dough with the heel, with the heel of my hand until the dough was smooth and elastic and I cleaned up like the residual butter that was all over the surface. There's no more, it's all in the dough. So I throw it in my big old bowl, plastic wrap and towel and a towel on the bottom too, that's what it said. And that dough's gotta rise up big time. So it's like a room temperature room for like three hours minimum. After that, I deflated it. Uh, actually, I don't know if I did because there's no footage of it. Turned it onto the floured surface with my floured hands and I just flattened and pushed the dough around until it was 10 inches or so. Then I make this thing called a letter fold. It's like taking one edge and folding it into the center. Then the other is folded on top. Flatten it into a rectangle and do the same thing again and let that baby sleep in the fridge for the night. We'll get back to this later. I hope that all made sense. First, I need to piss off a whole bunch of people by grabbing my mushrooms. This is one pound, around 450-ish grams. Uh, they're completely filthy. Stop it. I know people get all hot and bothered about washing mushrooms. I'm not gonna get into it again. I've already gone over this topic before. But let me just say, for the record, trim and wash mushrooms. It says it in the book, and the book is by Julia Child. If she says to do it, I'm gonna do it. I'm sorry, people. Also, these things are completely filthy. At least doing this the Julia Child way of doing it. Mushrooms into the water, rub, dub, dub. And then put them into my colander. Aw, look at the baby. I remember someone said, you know, it's the 21st century. You don't need to wash your mushrooms if you buy them in the grocery store. And my response to that is, well, why? Just to further my point, I'm gonna give them one more rinse and of course dry them. So I gotta trim them, so I believe all I need is the cap. So I need to dice this all up into 1 16 of an inch. There's the baby. Sorry. It's taking quite a while, so instead I have like this light bulb of an idea. You're never gonna believe it, but I finally picked up a food processor. I know, it's been like four years in the works, but this should be able to uh, save me some time, I believe. And I'm gonna just pulse this up until it's all minced up. There's some outliers in here, but for the most part, minced mushrooms are just a few pulses away. So this next step is just classic Julia. 
I need to um, clean dish towel and I'm gonna take some of the mushrooms. I've done this before, but some of the mushrooms and <laughs> add them to the dish towel and then I'm gonna squeeze the juices out of them. Out of the dish towel and do more. Squeeze out as much juice as possible. That is just nuts when you look at it. They're just like sponges. I know, maybe it's because I washed them, but whatever, it's out now. It's one shallot, finely minced, frying pan, an ounce and a half, 43 grams of butter. Oh, this is on a moderate high heat. Butter's foaming, in go the mushrooms. The shallot, all mixed together in the butter. So this next ingredient, I'm just choosing not to add to it. Sometimes I gotta make the call. Finely minced, mild cured, ready cooked ham. I don't know, it's just like I already got all this stuff going on, there's more stuff to go in. I'm just like, do I really need the mild cured, ready cooked ham? Cool, look at that evaporation. This is done when the mushroom pieces start to separate from each other, five minutes or so. After that, I'm gonna add a tablespoon and a half of flour and stir that for two minutes. This is Madeira wine, it's dry. Julia Child favorite, full bodied, medium sweet Madeira with a smooth nutty character. Nutty. The heat off, I'm gonna add four tablespoons. One. Two, three, four. I believe that's like 60 milliliters. And just a little more for good luck. Okay, I wanna blend that all together. Heat back on, moderate high heat for one more minute. Okay, so foie gras en bloc is an ingredient. Oh, you know, fatty duck, or goose, liver. But I'm choosing not to pick that up because I was about to and then I saw the price of it. And I was like, you know what? I don't need some foie gras today because it's just like, it's just me in here. Choosing this next option here, liver paste. It's a pate, right? You can make a pate with something that I used most recently in the aspic video. Chicken liver. So hey, what do you know? So hey, what do you know? I have chicken liver right beside me. So I've never made chicken liver pate before, but I found a recipe and it seems quite simple. So this is why I've chosen this option rather than picking up some already made stuff. Saucepan, half a pound of chicken liver, small chopped onion, smashed garlic, quarter teaspoon worth of thyme leaves, and bay leaf, half a teaspoon of salt, and half a cup, 118 milliliters of water. Bring to a simmer. Cover this, reduce the heat, and I have to cook this for like three minutes. Oh, I gotta stir it occasionally too. Until it's barely pink inside. That one is not pink inside. With a slotted spoon, I'm gonna grab the liver, the onions, the garlic, hold the bay leaf. Everything but the water in here. This thing's gonna run for its maiden voyage until it's coarsely pureed. Stick and a half, 165 grams of room temp butter. Oh. Add in two tablespoons at a time. Until it's all incorporated. I'm gonna add in brandy. Two teaspoons. One, two. Salt and pepper to taste. This looks like pate to me. Oh, shit. And what does it taste like? Mmm. Buttery, liver, flavor to it. It's like spreadable, worthy. It's, like, who needs foie gras when you have leftover chicken liver in the freezer? That's what I always say. Wrap it up with plastic wrap, and I'm gonna just chill it until I need it. After all that, I only need 42 grams. Hilarious, are you serious? I have this and another one in the fridge still. Liver paste into the Duke cell, along with one egg yolk, half a teaspoon of dried tarragon, pepper, salt. It's all mixed together. So set this aside for a bit. Anything as extravagant as this filet de boeuf demands an unusually good sauce. We suggest one from volume one. But I already did this last night. I kept busy last night. Some carrots, celery, and onion diced up. Look at the pretty colors. A few strips of bacon, I dice it up into the simmering water for 10 minutes. I'm using ghee today, clarified butter. A bunch of tablespoons worth of this Medium-ish heat, add the veggies and the, over at the bacon. Yep, that needs to go in there too. Beef stock, 
Won't mention if it's store-bought or if I made it. Who cares right now because I need to boil. Flour goes in and blend it all together on low heat until it's golden nut brown. I added in the boiling stock and whisked it like an SOB so it didn't clump. Tomato paste, then a cheesecloth filled with parsley, thyme, and bay leaf and I tie it up and in it went. Partially cover this stuff for two hours. I skimmed the scum, I didn't forget. Okay, when it's all done, I strain salt and pepper. You should. I don't know if I did because I don't have the footage of it. But it should be seasoned. Skim that scum. Plastic wrap on the surface and into the fridge it goes until it's go time. Here, this is an expensive piece of meat. $60 worth. <laughs> it's two and a half pounds of beef tenderloin. It's the filet mignon part of the tenderloin. And it needs to be eight inches long and even in diameter. It is. So with great cuts of beef like this come great responsibility. If I mess up this recipe today, I'm not gonna sleep for the next week. So everything needs to be spot on from here on out. I need to handle this beef properly. I need to do everything that is required and then some from here on out. No more jokes. <laughs> All right, so what I'm about to do is to me, one of the riskiest moves of this recipe and that is cutting this tenderloin into 16 even slices and each one being about half an inch thick. Like this immediately now just separates itself from other beef wellington recipes, including Gordon Ramsay's, where they just keep this whole damn thing intact. It's freaking me out, because I'm like wondering if I'm reading this thing correctly. Like, can it be 16 even slices? But it says it right there. Uh, here we go. Honestly, I think I chose more closer to three quarters of an inch than a half an inch, but I tried to be as even with each one as possible. Salt and pepper each slice. Baking tray. So this is a well-washed, damp cheesecloth. I'm gonna paint the inside of this with cooking oil. I got the Duke Cell stuffing right here. So take a piece of the roast. So I'm taking a tablespoon of this Duke Cell filling, spreading it on top, then a cut of the meat, and then that goes on top of the Duke Cell. And it's like essentially reforming this roast back together. Try to keep the shape that it once was. This is like a very hardcore food game of Jenga. Instead of with cheap wooden blocks, you have an expensive tenderloin. Time to move this down to the ground. Tie one loop of string around the length. What, how do I do that? To wrap the string around it, but I don't wanna lift this up and put it underneath, so I'll wrap it around this way. Then stretch the cheesecloth tightly over the meat. All right, twist each end and then tie it with the string. Then some more string around the circumference. supposed to resemble a fat sausage. You know what I'm gonna kinda do here is cut the pigtails off. Give her a trim. Now I was trying to interpret what this meant and it says baste well with fat or oil. And I, I guess she means while this is in the cheesecloth, just like this. So I'm gonna take some melted butter and just like, I don't know, cover the cheesecloth. So maybe like rub it all around in the, the butter. I don't know, she's not really clear about that, but uh, consider that kind of basted. So this beef needs to be roasted 25 minutes in a 425 degree oven, in like the upper part of the oven. And throughout doing this, I need to like turn it over and baste it with the butter. So the most terrifying thing for me is overcooking the beef. So instead of 25 minutes, how would I do 24 and a half? Because if I overcook it, then that's it. Just throw in the oven mitt, I'm, I'm done. Ooh, that cheesecloth is ready. Transfer, whoa, shit. Shit, shit, shit. How am I gonna get this off? I need to get this off. Transfer this to a platter or a tray. I wanna get it to what's under here. All right, so that way it's not gonna cook on this. Thing is, I don't know if I'm shoving the thermometer in the meat or the stuffing. Uh, is this meat? Yeah, okay, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm gonna just let this hang till room temperature. Just leave it there. A few hours have passed, I'm ready to get this thing going here. Firstly, preheat the oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Check. Slide the rack onto lower middle level. Check. Next up, set out all the equipment and ingredients listed. The cool room temperature pre-roasted beef. An oiled pizza tray. Egg glaze. Pastry brush. The chilled 
brioche dough. So what was supposed to happen is I put this in the fridge, it was gonna do a second rise, and then after that second rise, while it was in the fridge, I was supposed to firmly press it down and keep a weight on top so it wouldn't rise again. None of that ever happened because this is as much, this is what happened with the second rise. Not a whole lot, maybe just a little rising. Working rapidly from now on so that this dough softens as little as possible. All right, so I'm gonna take a quarter of my dough, it says, and roll it into a rectangle, oh. Never said anything about a rolling pin. Because this dough did not rise like I wanted it to, I think I have to use half of the dough into a quarter inch thick. Roll this up onto the pin. Hey! Onto this. It's gotta be able to fit the size of the roast. Cut the cloth off the beef. How do I get this off the cheesecloth? I guess I have to do the old flipperoo. This is the only way I can think of. Trim off excess dough around the beef. How much excess dough? Like what is too much? Thinking something like, okay, whatever. Okay, remaining dough into a rectangle. That's rectangular enough for me. On top it goes, tuck the covering dough under the bottom rectangle of the dough. That is covered, my friends. Gently brush on the egg wash. Any leftover dough, need to make some decorations for the thing. And this little cookie cutter, I'm gonna try to like take out these little pieces and kind of place them on. I'm not matching Julia's design in the cookbook exactly because I don't have enough leftover dough, but I'm trying to make this look as pretty as I can. I don't know. Come on, running out of time, Jimbo. And then egg wash on top of that too. Okay, into the oven, ASAPly. Bake for an initial 20 to 25 minutes till the pastry has browned nicely. Lower the temp to 350 for the rest of the baking. So this is the brown sauce I made yesterday. Let's get that heated up over on the stove. I feel like I should add this on top. Just for the end. Okay, so it's been 30 minutes and Julia has given me a time frame between 30 to 40 minutes to bake this thing. Kind of not that helpful. So there's a few indications to figure out when this is done. Firstly, can I smell the meat? I can't tell. Secondly, are there juices leaking out of the thing? Affirmative. I don't know what's going on underneath, but I don't want to push it any further than that because that was around, what, 33 minutes? I mean, I'm going to say that's done. Order up. The way she wants me to cut into this is by cutting all around here and then lifting this like it's a top, like it's a lid, and then everything is exposed. And then you cut into each separate piece like that and you put a little, I'm not gonna do that because I don't want to. I'm gonna cut into this good old fashioned way, which is just like straight through. If this isn't medium rare, I think I might cry. No! I uh, just put on a happy face and finished the video. <laughs> this is probably the most pissed off I've ever been on this show. Here's the thing, I cooked this for just a little over 30 minutes. And the cookbook said between 30 to 40 minutes. And I, you know, I was watching it like a hawk. And I was making sure that everything, yeah, I don't know where I lost it because it looks like it was done a long time ago. Is it because I cut it into slices and because they're so much thinner, they cook quicker and then it probably shouldn't even be 30 minute baking time. It should probably be like 25. I don't know. But at the end of the day, what I do know is I'm pissed off. All that matters at this point is how it tastes, right? Does it taste good? That's important. Mm. This thing is fantastic. It was really, really good. Now with the beef being as it is, 
Uh, it still tastes good. It's almost like stewed beef, but like a very expensive slice of it. But at the end of the day, when everything else around it is, uh, you know, stepping up, I'm in love with the brioche. It did not get soggy at all. It's crusty and buttery, and it makes for like perfect dipping for this sauce right here, which is another thing that was incredible. It's fantastic. This is fantastic. Now the mushroom duke cell is, um, I don't throw this term around ever because I don't really fully understand it, but it's umami. That's what it tastes like, umami, I believe. I don't really know, but I think. It's like rich and earthy. I even get a strong hit of that chicken liver pate in this. This would have been a perfect dish. It's like, it is that good. It's just missing that medium rare beef. Right here are my supporters on Patreon. There's a link in the description if you wanna check that out for yourself, see what it's all about. But this was Jamie and Julia. Bon appetit. Au revoir.